title of the message tonight, I'll get it out here in a second, the testimony of John the Baptist, and the only one that could give that testimony and do it correctly would be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These are his words and what he said to have about John the Baptist. You know, I get a kick with a lot of, especially young preachers, boy, I'm a Baptist and John the Baptist started the church. Come on. Why would Jesus himself say he was the last of the Old Testament prophets? Well, boy, we have his baptism. No, we don't. He was baptizing Israel to the receiving of Messiah. And by the way, it didn't work. They ended up killing John and rejecting Christ. And it opened the door for the church age that we live in. And they all work. Things work out the way God plans. And that was what he did. But you know, the Lord had quite a bit to say about John, and I know he appreciated him ever so much. They were only six months apart, and they grew up side by side, and I'm sure the Lord was waiting for John when he made his introductions and, and turned Israel to look for Messiah. Well, uh, let's see, the, the text we'll start with is John chapter 3 and verse 22 through 30. This is almost a lesson more than a sermon, uh, but I'll, I'll try to keep it as much a sermon as possible. A lot of verses, just write them down, you can look them up later. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 22 through 30. And these, uh, and these things, after these things, Jesus uh, and his disciples, I'll get it right in a minute. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptized in, in Anon near the, uh, to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, uh, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom... Thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptized, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. I've often thought in my mind how it must have affected the Lord to watch that decrease. 
Here's John, son of God, in fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. Repent, repent. Came out of the out of the woods in uh, in a camel hair coat with honey and and uh, in one hand and and preaching with the other and eating a white locust in the other and eating. I wonder if he dipped the locust into the honey and ate them. See, the only advantage I could figure out of eating locusts, and my wife knows me with this. Used to be in the old days, I always had to have a toothpick after I got through eating. And uh, boy, you had the locusts, you've got a built-in toothpick with some of those legs. But Jesus watched him from there, and the more he preached and more he baptized, his disciples actually, the more John was moved out of the limelight till finally in prison his head was cut off and his life was lost and i want to talk to you about that and the way jesus saw it here's the outline the testimony of john the baptist and it says given by our savior first of all in matthew 3 1 the message he preached jesus tells us about and then you drop down to number two the mystery he presented and he was a mystery to look at him, <laughs> they had a hard time figuring him out. That's John 1, verses 6 through 8. And then number three, and I used the word mendacious, but I had later changed that to the word, the, the mean treatment. Mendacious means disrespectful and, and uh, uh, flaunted about. The mean treatment that he received, he didn't deserve what he got. Mark chapter 6, verse 14 through 29. And then lastly, a four-point sermon, the memorial that he was given. And that's really the key to this sermon. This is what Jesus was, is preaching about. The memorial, John chapter 5, verse 33 through 35. And that Jesus remembered him in one of four ways. Of the four ways Jesus presented himself to the world, the first was through John the Baptist. What a testimony. We've already prayed. Let's take a look at this, shall we? Go with me to Matthew chapter 3 and notice verse number 1. Matthew 3 and verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel hair and a, a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then, then went out of him, uh, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions around Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So here he is in Matthew chapter three, the message that he preached. There are two things about it here that I want to show you. The first in verses 1 through 3 was by the word. You know, it's amazing to me. God can speak to man numerous ways. He can just touch a heart. He can use a sunrise or a sunset. He can use a circumstance in your life. The, I recall being in an emergency room with my wife and our little tiny boy. It was about this long. And the doctor said, uh, hold him, you put your gowns on, hold him, talk to him, get to know him, because he'll die tonight. And as soon as he's dead, give him to a nurse, and you can go home. You know, you, you can imagine, and, and a, a pastor, and my first reaction was not a good one. I held this little boy in my hands when the, he was having heart attacks, one right after another, fibrillation, and that tiny little body and me, I looked up and I said, God, you kill this little boy and I'll never serve you again. You know how hard that is for me to tell? But the things that happen in your life, they have a purpose in their happenings. And that's the one where I went up in the mountains and God alone, I told God, I won't go down. What I just did, I won't go down until you give me a victory over it. And to know how I dared to do something like that. And I wandered up there. My wife's with the kid. By the way, he's still alive today. Uh, and, and I wandered up there until I finally got peace with God about that. 
all things work together for good to those that love God, for those that are called according to his purpose. That's what John was sent for. He was one of the ways that God could use to speak to people. Powerful man, powerful man. By word he spoke. The first thing he spoke was about repentance. Found in these, he came preaching in the wilderness saying, repent ye. Imagine this guy in a camel hair coat with a leather girdle. I forgot about that. With a uh, locust in one hand and honey in the other, crying to Israel, repent. They listened. They heard his word. He baptized not unto salvation. He baptized unto repentance to receive Messiah. And it was meant that Israel, boy, look at America today. We're so divided. If we could all gather together, we could be a great nation again. I'm not sure we've ever been a great nation other than certainly not spiritually. Oh, I guess back in the 1700s, we had a rising and many men went out. But here, God wanted Israel to gather together and that John would point with his finger and say, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. John did his job, and Israel listened. But the priests and the Levites and the scribes would not listen. They said, Crucify him, crucify him. We'll not have this man rule over us. You know, you don't always know what the, what the word's going to do. But I know this, he had a timely message. That's what you have to remember. Your witness is a timely message. You begin to speak to someone about Christ, it's a timely message. They need the Lord. And uh, not, not only was it a timely message, but it was a tested message in verse number 8. Uh, bring, they, be, they bring forth, therefore, fruits meet to repentance. A tested message showing that people repented. So much of religion today it doesn't have anything to do with repentance. It has to do with what man does and not what God does. The worst thing you want is a church filled of people that have no presence of the Spirit in them, who have no real solid testimony of being born again. John pictures that here by word, and then secondly, uh, the message he preached was by appearance. <laughs> uh, what he wore, can you imagine? And, and it was a picture of a prophet. Israel knew what he represented. He came walking out of the wilderness. He's been up in the mountains praying and getting the messages from God, catching some bees and getting the honey away from them, and catching some locusts rather to go with the honey that he has. And all of a sudden, men look up and say, look who's coming. They know the Old Testament. And Elijah, Elijah will come out of the wilderness and you'll come preaching repentance. They pointed. They thought, sure, that's who it was. Uh, what he wore, what he ate. By the way, what he ate was a picture of dedication. Uh, yes, that's true. You'd have to be dedicated to not to so much to eat wild honey. Uh, any kind of honey is good for you. Matter of fact, the book of Proverbs uh, says, eat honey. Didn't ask you if you want to. Didn't say whether you like it or not. It said, eat honey. God put the bees here for us to be able to get the honey, and it even purports to the fact that it'll help you with your memory. And what are they promoting today? Bu buzzy bees. Buzzy beesy. Have you seen that? They're, they're gummies for your memory. And you eat those, and people tell about how, it's, how much better they sleep. And sure, God knew what he was doing. And, and it was it led them to uh, him, pictured him in dedication. Matthew 6, 25 goes with that. First Timothy 6, 6 through 8, the simplicity of it is seen here. In me, uh, uh, oh, let me get it. First Timothy 6, 6 through 8. Uh, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For you brought nothing in this word, world, and you take certain, you take nothing out. Listen, having food and raiment. That's what just walked out of the wilderness. Food and raiment on this man who said, repent. I wonder if maybe we, no, I don't want you to go out and buy a camel hair robe. And uh, you can go ahead and get some honey if you bring me a jar. If you're going to do the locust thing, stay away from me. I don't want to watch it. But you know, we could pick up on some of these things in our message. 
that we preach to others. The message that he preached was a wonderful message. But look at John 1, verses 6 through 8. John chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. The mystery that he represented, he represents one of the seven mysteries that were given in the church age, the last stage that received these things. If we have seven mysteries that were revealed to us, and he was the one that opened the door to the mysteries, John 1, verses 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, capital L, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Here you picture the mystery that's been presented. John is, people see him, and they're drawn to him. Hordes of people came and followed in baptism, but John was pointing his finger. He wasn't doing this, he was doing this. There's one that cometh after me. We'll have that verse. Uh, who shoe latches, I'm not able to unla unlash, unlash. I got that all messed up. Uh, it's not me. I'm representing one that's to come. And that was the mystery. Israel didn't get it. They did not get all the 333 Old Testament prophecies that told them about Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? 333 Old Testament prophecies pointed past John to where John was pointing to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, don't be too surprised with that. We're past the age of mysteries and men still don't get it. They can't look past themselves. They can't look past what I am and what I want to be and who I am. Well, I'll tell you that millennial just generation like to ruin this country. They don't want to work. You, you know who most of these people, next time you're driving around, that guy's got a cardboard sign. I'm hungry. Did, did you ever look close? The sign is at least three, four months old. It's all dog-eared and dirty and you've been hungry all that time? You know, no, I'm too lazy to work and I want you to fill my pocket with money. Don't give those people money. They have more money than you do. They've been tracked down and followed and many of them make 200 plus dollars a day standing there and giving you this look. You know, man, leave that alone. The, they didn't get it. They don't get it. That in our day, the millennials, they don't want to work. They don't want to be leaders. They don't, they want, give me, give me, give me, give me. Boy, if anything opened the door to the coming Laodicean age, I say coming, I'll tell you the truth. We're the Philadelphian age. Do you understand that? The ages that are given in Revelation, we're the sixth one. And that, that is the Philadelphian age. And he comes quickly for us. We're the, the mysteries are solved in us. We're carried out of here. And when we're carried out of here, it leaves the millennials. It leaves the Laodiceans. They think they're okay. They don't have need of anything. They don't, why? Because they take what you've got. And that's what they're doing now. They're going in the neighborhood saying, you reparation, you owe us, we want your house, you owe us your house. Well, I'll tell you what, the mysteries unfold and they started here. First of all, uh, the mystery was uh, revealed to them. Look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 1. Zechariah and Malachi, just for you get over to the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Here it is. There I will send my messenger before me. That's John the Baptist. The first mystery revealed is that the Old Testament has closed. John is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Now comes Messiah to present the kingdom to Israel. And, and we'll even see a verse in here. Jesus said to the disciples, to Israel, had you believed him, he would have been Elijah. If you're, if you're smart enough to figure that out, you understand the mysteries better than I do. 
somehow DNA wise I don't know but John the Baptist would have become Elijah because he has to come before Israel can be set up and Jesus made a legitimate offering offered to Israel and if they had received it John the Baptist some DNA thing I don't know he would have been Jesus would have said this is Elijah he's come and I'm setting up my kingdom but you know they didn't get the first they didn't get any of the seven mysteries and really understand them look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 13 through 16 these were all introductory portions are in the first chapter Luke chapter 1 verse uh, 13 through 16 but the angel said unto him talking to Zechariah fear not Zechariah for thy prayers heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. That happened. Remember when he moved, when, uh, when Mary was introduced and was carrying the child, and John moved in the womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers and the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Whoa, how far did I want to go with that? 16 was where I was supposed to have stopped. He was John the Baptist. There's never been another like him. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. When he died, the book was closed. He didn't start this church. That's not our, uh, our beginning. But he opened the door legitimately to Israel to see the Messiah and received him. And what did they say? Crucify him. Crucify him. We'll not have this man to rule over us. What a sad testimony. He could have been Elijah, and I told you that. Now that's in Luke. Uh, in Matthew 17, we won't turn there. 10 through 13, he was told that. Mark 10, 9 and verse 11, we're told that. Luke chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus said it in those texts. Those are the synoptic gospels. It's the same testimony told three times by three men that Jesus said, if you receive me as Messiah, this is Elijah. Well, Israel didn't do that. But it did open the door to the mysteries of the church age. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, if I don't preach on it, I'll teach it in Sunday school here before long, the seven mysteries of the church. Notice the third thing. Not only the message he preached and the mystery he represented, but the mendacious, the mean treatment he received when he presented himself. Look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 14. Mark chapter 6 and verse 14. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said, That John, uh, the Baptist, was risen from the dead, and therefore many works to show forth themselves in him. Others said, This is Elias. And others said that it is the prophet. And really, it was Christ, because Herod said, uh, He heard them, and he said, It is John whom I beheaded. And if we followed all the texts and put them all together, a situation happened, in fact, that'll come in here a little bit, uh, where John the Baptist confronted Herod with the sin that he was involved in. You know, I guess you get mendacious treatment if you stand for the truth. And we always need to stand for the truth. There are going to be times when your own family members won't accept it. There will be times when Christians have lost their jobs, especially today. Of all places, Kroger's? King Supers just filed, fired a bunch of employees because they wouldn't wear the LGBTQ, MNOPQRS. They wouldn't wear the rainbow colors to represent the homosexuals. King Supers? And they fired the employees because they wouldn't wear that to honor. Well, good for them. And I hope their jobs they find, the Trump will help them find them, and they'll get paid three times what they would have been paid by those cheapskates. You know what, I guess this point is, it's not always easy to be a Christian. You say, well, boy, you never, I've never had that problem. Well, maybe you never heard this message. Maybe you never made the comparison. 
It's not supposed to be easy. You're supposed to take a stand and not waver from it. You don't allow someone to cuss God's name in your presence. You speak up. You, you never apologize because you won't take the drink that's offered you. Boy, I get so mad at that. Oh, thank you for offering, but I don't drink. What do you mean, thank you for offering? If you had a testimony, they wouldn't have offered it to you. They would know that you don't drink. I had, in my business world, I had a couple of men that did that to me on purpose, trying to get me to take a drink. When I quit smoking years ago, my two brothers took me on a fishing trip. They did it on purpose. One was on this side of the lake, and the other brother was on this narrow side of the lake. On the other side, he said to my brother, I don't have any cigarettes. Light one and have Judd bring it over to me. My brother said, okay. And he lit a cigarette. He handed it to me. I threw it in the water. I said, I don't smoke, and I'm not carrying your dumb cigarette. I know what you were planning to do. He looked over at my brother Bob on the other side and went. <laughs> so I fished by myself. They went around the other side and smoked the cigarette. Stand up for what you are. Take a stand. John said to Herod, you can't have that woman. You can't take her. It's another man's wife. Herod was so angry, he put him in jail. In jail, uh, the Herodias' daughters came and danced, and Big Mouth Herod said, boy, I can imagine what the dance was. He said, ask what you will up to half of my kingdom, and I'll give it to you. So Herodias' daughter went to her, and she said, Mom, what do you want? She said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter, on a charger. The daughter ran back to Herod and said, I would like the head of John the Baptist. Herod knew that if he killed John the Baptist, it was going to start a civil war in his country. So he put him in jail. And he had him in jail, rather. And now he's got him in jail, and he's promised. So he brought him out and had his head cut off. I trust we won't run it. Things are going to happen, folks. I, I, I hate to be the bearer. I hope you're watching. I, I see no way out of what's coming for us in days ahead and you want to be well prepared don't don't step into a place where you could get hurt don't offer that but on the other side of that keep your testimony keep your testimony don't back off because you're a christian don't make apologies to somebody because you won't take their drink say take your drink i drank that before you were born and i know what it does to you and i won't drink it now by the way let me get a bible and show you why Maybe you get a chance to lead somebody to the door. The mean treatment, he was cast into prison, Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 12. While he was in prison is when Herodias' daughter danced that dance, and, and uh, the question of Christ came up, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 1. I'm skipping five spies, some of these. For his preaching, he was feared. Herod said, I've killed that prophet. And now he's risen from the dead. They thought it was John the Baptist that was coming back. And that Herod immediately thought, that's, that's John. He's going to come back and get even with me. And all this was done to him for sin's sake. Here in Matthew, in Mark 6, verse 21 through 26. And when the convenient day was come, the Herod on his birthday made a supper and so on and so forth. The daughter of Herodia came and danced. It pleased Herod. Look what he said. And whatever you ask, I will give to thee up to half of my kingdom. Verse 23. Man, it set John up for what was going to happen. Herodia was licking her chops, said, I want his head. For sin's sake, John gave up his life. You know, we, we ought to be willing. I don't know that any of us could explain this. But for me, live is Christ. But to die is gain. If you end up having to give your life, in our day it seems, it seems ludicrous to even talk like this. But we do have missionaries in foreign countries. In one of the Oriental countries, 120 preachers were killed in one day. They went through the villages and killed all the pastors. We, last year we had that missionary that went over. We hadn't had him, but he went over with his wife and five or seven kids. They got into the place. They went to their house. They were unloading their luggage. And some men drove by and shot him in the head and killed him. First day on the mission field, 
There's a mother with seven little kids and a dead husband. They had to send the mission board, had to send help over to get her and the kids, take care of getting his body home. It isn't all cream and gravy like you and I see it. I, in many ways, I think we make it try to look like cream and gravy. Is that a good illustration? Uh, I have another one. I won't go there with Eagle Brand, sweetened condensed milk. We try to make it look like something good when the truth is it's only looking that way because we're not taking a stand. We need to understand you are not a friend of this world. You're not to love the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man have the love of the world, listen, the love of the Father is not in him. You're going to have to take a stand at some point. So will I. And as these days get worse, I, I would hate to think of some of the things that we might have to stand for. Well, the last thing here concerning his testimony is in John chapter 5. The message he preached, well, we have the same one, by word and appearance. They ought to see us different. You know what it's called in the Bible? Your behavior. Now, conversation, pardon me. Your, be, your, let your conversation, to us that means talking to somebody. But in the Bible it means your manner of life. Your manner of life ought to be evident enough so that uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says that you would be ready always when they ask of you the reason of the hope within. You'd be ready to give an answer. Has anybody ever asked you? I think that was in the message this morning or last week. Has anybody ever asked you why you're different? That's what this is about, being different. And folks knowing that we're on the Lord's side and we stand with him. So here it is, the last point, John chapter 5 and verse uh, 33. I'm in 6, pardon me. 5 and at verse number uh, 33. The memorial he was given. Jesus did this. Now all of these relate to the Lord that I gave. But this one is the Lord speaking. Here he is. You, ye send unto John, and he bears witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimonies from men, but those things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. That's Jesus with a testimony about John, the memorial that Jesus gave to John. I remember where Jesus was preaching and John was in jail. He, he heard the miracles and, and the things that were Jesus doing. And he sent two of his disciples, said, he, he had a question, he's human like us. He said, go ask him if he's really the Christ or we, do we look for another? So the men came and asked Jesus, said he never answered. He started doing the miracles of Isaiah in front of them. And as they saw those miracles, he turned to him and he said, Now, go tell John what you saw me do. That you saw the dead raised and the, the lame healed and the blind man to see. And tell John that you saw the man who did that. They went back and told John. And John was convinced Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus gives this memorial to him. By the way, the four memorials that are here, the first was John. The second was the very work that Jesus did in verse number 36. I have greater witness than that of John, for the work which the Father has given me to finish, the same work that I do, bear witness of me and the Father that sent me. What's the finished work? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. Seven words, seven statements that Jesus made that showed the work that he finished. And then the third testimonial is God the Father himself. The Father himself which has sent me has borne witness of me. And you've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. But if you have not his word abiding in you for whom uh, he hath sent uh, him, ye believe not. And in essence, if you don't believe me, you don't believe him. And I think of the best example of that Peter, James, and John, Jesus said, uh, there be those of you standing here that will not taste of death till you see me in my kingdom. Matthew makes it hard to 
figure that out. But if you read the other two Gospels, it's easy. Because Matthew has a chapter change. But the next verse says, And the next day he took them up on a mountain apart. The other disciples stayed. He took Peter, James, and John. And up on the top of the mountain, all of a sudden there stood Moses and Elijah standing beside Jesus. And the Father's looking down. That's Christ in his kingdom. And Peter messed it all up. He said, Lord, it's good that if we're here. Let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now you have the Father. The voice said, the, book, the scripture says, and a voice came from heaven. It didn't whisper. A voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Man, I could picture an earthquake with that. And as in the days of Elijah, I could picture strong winds and angels shouting and all these things. And, and all of a sudden, those men bowed their head. When they looked up, Jesus was glorified in their presence. He was the shining light. And those three men got to see him as he is in his kingdom. And God the Father said, there. Don't make dumb statements like that, Peter. <laughs> and Peter apologized to the Lord. When they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone. Jesus stood there alone in his heavenly appearance. And they got to see that. Well, here it was, the testimony of the Father. Hear ye him. Three times God spoke from heaven concerning his son. And that was one of the three times. The memorial was the Father, and then the last memorial is the one that they left for us. Uh, the, let me get it here real quick. Uh, in, number, in verse 39, the scripture. The last memorial Jesus left, the first was John the Baptist, and the fourth is this. Can you imagine that God had man make this so simple that a little child can read it? Bible schools can be conducted and kids can be taught the truth and they can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Old drunks can bow their head and not be drunks anymore. People that have messed their lives up to no end can have their lives turned around and go on and serve God in great glory. What did it? The scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Oh, wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. John 17, 17, Jesus said, now, now are you clean. Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. John 15, 3. Uh, John 17, 17. Uh, now are you clean through the words that I have spoken to you. The very words out of Christ's mouth cleansed. And we have it in writing. And, and if you're just a reader, if you're just doing it to get in your 15 or 20 minutes, you'll never get it. But if you pray ahead of time, you hold this thing real close. You don't have to do this, but I like to do it. I said, I worry sometimes. I mean, I worry about David and Sandra. They're in this building every time I turn around. And one of these days, don't you ever open my door if it's closed. Because sometimes I've been in there praying and I wake up. And I got my Bible on my chest. When you get old, you nap now and then. And I think to myself, man, I hope that Sandra didn't come in here with a camera. Because she's going to pass that picture all over. Then I think, David never let her do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's precious. Let the word be precious. Let's go back to the first one. I'm going to close there in verse number 33. The memorial that was given. The first one is John is called a burning and a shining light. Isn't that a special thought? Burning means consuming. Your testimony should consume others. It should beat down any argument they have. It should be willing, it should be able to change their mind through the power of the scripture and the fact that you're using the word of God to speak. You become a consuming fire, shining. A shining light is a testimony. I bought some of these light bulbs. Didn't we bought these light bulbs? You go around your house and you screw them in and they have a little hook that you hang on the light. 
Now they're regular light bulbs. They last 15,000 hours or something. But if you have a power failure, all those light bulbs light up. And you go over and unscrew them and, hook, and screw them into the little hook, and then you can carry them into any room and hang them up. They'll light up the room. I have five of those in our home. And I'm waiting for the power to go out. Wouldn't you know it? Hadn't gone out one time. Used to seem like it was always going out. And I hated it because this woman must have 1,100 candles. And the minute a storm comes, our house is so smoky and smelly of wax and, and perfume all over the house. But she doesn't have to do that anymore because we have light bulbs. And Jesus said John was a shining light. Boy, think of that as the close of the message. Your testimony should light up your, the room where you're at. Your testimony should have an effect on others that are around you. It becomes the testimony of him that we share with others. Matthew 5, verses 14 and 15. We'll not go there. He was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Matthew 11, verse 7 through 14. He was the last prophet to ever walk on the face of this earth. He heard the bridegroom. He heard him when he was in the womb. He heard that he was going to be, he didn't hear him, but he heard that he was coming, and John moved in the womb. And there at the end, he stood in a river. He's baptizing people, hundreds of people, and all of a sudden he stops. I'm sure it was the Holy Spirit said, look over there. And, and I think he pointed. He's in the water, and the people are all around, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The next day he's up on the road. There's a significance there. Now he's in the working, in the moving position and coming down the road he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Two is emphatic. Twice John said, Jesus is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That was his final testimony. That was his final joy. And I think about John as he watched from paradise i don't know what all he was allowed to see but he knew that christ had given up his life and he saw him when he came down he went into tartarus with the angels that's in your bible then he went into hades where the unsaved are that's in your bible then he went into paradise where the saints were and john the baptist was in paradise and jesus walked into paradise I wonder if maybe he didn't first go and take John by the hands. I wonder if he didn't draw him near and say, you did your job. You fairly presented me so that the world would know that I'm the cross, the Christ. It's not your fault they rejected me. You did your job. And you know what John heard him say? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's your testimony. That's what you're waiting for. Your testimony from having used the word of God and lived for the Lord is that one day you'll stand in front of the Lord as a, as a bright, burning, shining light, and you'll hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, I appreciate the parallel there between John's life and the life that we're privileged to live today. Might we have a solid testimony? None of us can be like John, but we ought to want to emulate John and do the things that he did that glorified his Lord and Savior. We ought to remember from this verse, from this message, that he must increase and we must decrease. God, help us to have that spirit in our heart, and we'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnals and turn to number 280. 280, just a general uh, invitation song for tonight. Softly and tenderly. God spoke to your heart. You want to take a few minutes to pray. And if you want to come to an old-fashioned altar, you're welcome to. But let's stand together. We'll just sing a verse. Do pray. Take a moment and pray. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portal, he's waiting and watching, watching for you 
and for me come home come home ye who are weary come home earnestly tenderly Jesus is calling calling oh sinner come home as we dismiss tonight I didn't mention during the announcements we do have our first dinner since COVID thing I think we did sneak in one in there but on uh, the fourth the fourth the first Sunday of uh, October we're going to be having a meal in the gym there's plenty of room for uh, social distancing and no that isn't dancing it's distancing and uh, we'll have the table spread out I'm fixing barbecued ribs and brisket ooh, ooh, ooh. we're gonna have a meal if you can provide potatoes and and a vegetable something if you sign up anything else I don't care if you don't even sign up for it just bring something a side and or a dessert and we'll have plenty of food and a good turnout invite someone to come and uh, we'll thank god for that time that we have together all right lord bless you give me a minute to get to the door and you're dismissed.